Good morning. Uh, we're heading into the last unit of this course. Uh, this week you'll be reading about uh, physical and motor development and physical growth in middle childhood and adolescence. And in each of the subsequent weeks of this course, you'll be reading material that covers over more than one chapter. You'll be looking at material in the chapters on middle childhood and also sort of to finish off several topics you'll be reading uh, in areas uh, from the adolescent chapters. So make sure you look at your syllabus, see what pages are required and, um, and try to read the middle childhood sections and the adolescent sections at the same time or at least in the same week. Well this week I want to say a little bit about physical motor growth in middle childhood and adolescence. In a way, as you'll see with the subjects of cognition and social and emotional growth, physical growth in middle childhood and adolescence present some clear kinds of contrasts and changes from each other. For example, in middle childhood, rates of growth for kids from about 6 to 12 are fairly slow and gradual. Uh, most children grow about 2, 2 and a half inches a year, for example, over that period or grow another foot from about age 6 to age 12. So the average child who started this stage at about 4 feet of height will by age 12 be about 5 feet tall. During adolescence, growth rates dramatically increase. In fact, the beginning of puberty is really marked by that growth spurt, the sudden acceleration of height um, that you see in early and mid-adolescence. In fact, in the two fastest growing years of the growth spurt, uh, children can grow two to, instead of two to three inches a year, they can grow four to five inches a year, nearly double the rate. So in fact, by the end of adolescence, uh, children have grown another foot again. I mean, just think of that for a minute. The average six-year-old is about four feet high the average uh, 18 to 20 year old is closer to six feet tall. And it took six years for the middle childhood foot to be gained. And uh, most kids attain adult height sometime between the ages of 12 and 16 or 12 and 17. In other words, in another uh, four or so year period, they've grown another foot. In a similar kind of way, uh, weight increases slowly but steadily through middle childhood. Uh, interestingly, children nearly double their weight between the ages of 6 and 12, adding uh, perhaps about uh, 5 to 6 pounds, um, 7 pounds a year. So that the child at age 6 who weighs about 40 pounds may weigh about uh, 80 pounds by the time they're 12. In adolescence, there's an increase, a noticeable increase in weight uh, fairly quickly as you move into puberty as well. And so um, weight increases uh, for adolescents uh, much faster than it does in middle childhood. And so children who enter uh, adolescence at uh, 70 to 80 pounds may find themselves another 40 or 50 pounds uh, heavier by the time they're 16 years old. Uh, both height and weight increase a little bit into the latter part of adolescence and even early adulthood, but we're mostly focusing on maybe kids up to age about 16. So a 16-year-old is about two feet taller than he was at age six and weighs uh, close to 80 pounds more, close, close to three times what he weighed when he was six years old. Well, quantitatively, that's certainly uh, a lot of change that takes place. But qualitatively, the changes in physical motor ability and in organ system development uh, in some ways are even more dramatic. Uh, over the period from uh, 6 to 12, again, through middle childhood, uh, children become, uh, for example, uh, very coordinated, very agile. Uh, they run quickly. They balance very well. They're very flexible. There's a wonderful combination of strength and flexibility that you see in a lot of kids this age. And uh, many children by the time they're 10, 11, 12 years old uh, are very uh, graceful uh, and um, combine, as I say, coordination with strength and agility. In adolescence, they may go through a period of 
uh, a bit of clumsiness or awkwardness physically early in the period as their bones of the uh, wrists, for example, and hands or the ankles and feet grow at a slightly faster rate and they find themselves tripping over their feet or dropping things. But uh, uh, adolescents also, in gaining weight, are gaining a lot of muscle mass and grow uh, in terms of strength and um, uh, as a result, force and uh, speed and the like much faster than they did in uh, middle childhood. So children um, change quite a bit and this affects their uh, interactions with the world in a lot of ways. As you look around and you see kids uh, in the school age years, for example, uh, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, you see them engaged in a lot greater variety of both formal and informal physical activities. They ride their bikes, they uh, climb trees, uh, they skateboard with friends. Uh, in more formal ways, they begin to participate more in sports in their communities. And uh, actually more children today, uh, probably 20 to 25 million kids uh, in the middle childhood period, engage in some formal sport activity during the school year. Uh, between two and three million play little league baseball, for example. And soccer in the fall has become increasingly popular for both boys and girls. In fact, many kids over-exercise in the sense that they participate in the same sport for the entire year rather than just for a season. And some psychologists and physiologists have said, number one, it's good for kids to have a break. Uh, they need to have a change of pace from the practices and games that make up a lot of the requirements of school-age sports. But they also need to participate in different sports and take a break that way. That overusing the same muscles uh, for soccer or uh, swimming or hockey can be detrimental over time and may increase the risk of sports-related injuries. So many physiologists looking at school-age children recommend cross-training, taking breaks, uh, and reducing some of the competitiveness uh, in terms of the requirements that many sports um, ask. Now that's quite different from the social side. Um, uh, not only do children participate in intramural sports, for example, they may be on travel teams, they may be on teams related to their Y or their Boys and Girls Club, they may have to travel uh, out of state to participate in meets at a very high competitive level. Uh, for the most part, the increased physical activity um, that these demands place on kids uh, is positive, that is, it's associated with better health and um, more strength and better diet and the like. However, it is important to keep in mind that for some kids it may produce too much stress, uh, not just on the body, but also psychologically to excel and be very good. Um, I have a lot of reservations about that that I'll probably hold off till the chapter on social and emotional growth. Um, I think sports for kids in the school age years should mostly be about number one, having fun, number two, the social experience, and number three, learning the basic skills and practicing those skills. It's very difficult overall to predict who at age seven, eight, or nine, who is good as a, at a sport, will be good as a high school athlete, let alone a college athlete. So really what you're setting at this age is attitudes towards exercise, attitudes towards diet, how I feel about myself as a participant and the like. Uh, and too much competition and too um, stressful demands can have a deflating effect on uh, the desire of kids to participate in sports. A last word on this perhaps in talking about adolescence um, and as a kind of comparison. School age kids are among the healthiest of certainly the lifespan up until adulthood. Uh, they've gotten over their childhood diseases. They tend to be physically active. They still eat regular meals, uh, mostly prepared by their families. When you look at adolescents, their overall health and in, in many measures of physical ability actually decline. Uh, as adolescents take over more control of their eating, for example, they may either eat less or skip meals or eat more poorly. Uh, as their lives become more busy and active, uh, more homework from school, uh, after school activities, maybe even by mid-adolescence some working, 
their focus on eating and eating the right foods and good foods may in fact go down. They may show an increase in some habits, for example, uh, early cigarette smoking would be one, that may end up having long-term detrimental effects. And in terms of overall exercise, compared to middle childhood, their exercise levels often decrease as well. They may have less physical uh, exercise as part of school, as phys ed becomes less important and less prominent feature. There may not be the varieties of intramural and informal activities available to kids as middle school and then high school sports uh, with more restricted participation take over. So the participation of children, I should say adolescents, in voluntary sports activities declines compared to middle childhood. And it declines more for women than for men, reflecting broader social uh, and societal um, expectations about being athletic and about being physically fit and healthy. As a result, uh, adolescents uh, are, as I say, somewhat more prone uh, to um, obesity, uh, somewhat more prone to uh, illnesses uh, because they don't keep up. And they even in the area of sleep often uh, go through their days somewhat sleep deprived. Uh, part of this is related to hormone changes early in adolescence where uh, uh, the effect of hormones is that it changes our biological clock so that uh, 14 and 15 year olds who had a set bedtime in middle childhood may find themselves staying up late 11, 12 o'clock and getting up earlier in the morning because school starts earlier as you move up in grades. Uh, this is always a surprise to hear but the average uh, recommended amount of sleep for teenagers is in the vicinity of nine hours and the average teenager gets in the vicinity of seven to seven and a half hours. So teenagers are typically going through their days with some sleep deprivation. Uh, well, guess what? So are you and I. We should be getting probably about two hours more sleep a night as adults than we typically get. Um, that is uh, not going to have an overwhelming effect on us and perhaps not on teens either, uh, but it uh, uh, fatigue reduces uh, both learning in class, makes us a bit more emotional, and uh, contributes to uh, kind of overall, uh, uh, overall decline in, um, in health. Nonetheless, most adolescents um, are pretty healthy, uh, particularly um, uh, in this country where habits of eating and uh, habits of exercise are likely to have reduced our risks of illness uh, and the like. The last thing I want to just say a word about is uh, organ systems, uh, the um, organs of the body uh, and the brain and nervous system. Over the period of middle childhood, uh, children double their muscle strength and over the period of adolescence, they essentially double their muscle strength again. So much like we saw with physical weight and size, there's a tremendous change in uh, muscular ability across the years from 6 to 12, and then say from 12 to, to 16 to 18 years of age. The brain also continues to grow uh, some more subtle kinds of ways. Uh, brain growth in terms of weight uh, is very um, gradual across middle childhood, uh, only increasing perhaps about two or three percent. You might remember that at age six, uh, average brain weight was already about 95 percent of its adult weight. By the end of adolescence, uh, brains, of course, have achieved their adult weight. But there are certain kinds of growth that are particularly important, I think, for understanding other aspects of adolescent development. For example, uh, neurons that connect the frontal lobe of the brain to uh, areas uh, in uh, the parietal lobe may influence uh, something which seems very separate from that, but the ability to make decisions and to inhibit behavior. We often think of inhibition as a psychological thing, like willpower, or making good decisions, or thinking straight. But neurologists would tell us that the neural pathways that connect the thinking centers of the frontal lobe with the voluntary action centers uh, in, the, in the cortex need to be strengthened before thought can truly affect action. And so they would point out that uh, sometimes teenagers make poor decisions 
Or after the fact, you say, what were you thinking? Or they don't assess risk very well and get themselves in trouble. And part of that emotional and social maturity certainly reflects uh, physiological or neurological synaptic connections that will grow. The other aspect of that I'd mention as well uh, is the effect of hormones. Uh, hormones influence uh, the brains of uh, men and women, contributing not just to the uh, physiological uh, primary and secondary sexual characteristics that we see on the outside, but also affecting uh, how the brains work. And even again, though these are fairly minor kinds of changes, they may in fact uh, uh, have something to do, we'll find out over time, with some of the sex differences in boys and girls. Some of the aggressiveness in boys may be related certainly to socialization, that is, the ability and encouragement of boys to be more uh, aggressive uh, and competitive uh, compared to girls. But some of it may reflect the effects of testosterone, not just on the body, but on the brain and nervous system as well. So again, in reading these chapters on physical and motor growth, uh, try to think about how the boundaries of growth affect the ability of kids to participate uh, in the social worlds in which they are growing up, uh, to participate in sports and exercise and the like, and to participate in cognitive ways uh, to understanding uh, subject matter that we'll talk about next time. Good luck reading. Uh, I'll talk to you soon.